Today we have come to the last portion of the book of Nehemiah. We started a journey in February of this year and hasn't it been enriching, hasn't it been challenging? I personally have really enjoyed the delivery of this teaching. I like all the different styles of those who come and in their own way share the word of God with us. So I want to begin by saying thank you to all those who have been a part of this series and also for Reverend Nathan who faithfully has produced the recap videos for us just to refresh us and remind us of what we have learned. I hope you've been blessed. I hope you've been challenged. Can we give our thanks to God and to those who have been a part of this series? We have seen how God has used this prophet, a remarkable man, the cupbearer of the king of Persia, to restore the worship of Yahweh amongst the children of Judah in Jerusalem. Well, I've selected a theme for this closing message, and it's God's stress management and renewal. Somebody say that. God's stress management and renewal. And we're going to be looking at the final acts of Nehemiah in this second portion of chapter 13. And we probably can remember from what has been shared that after the walls were built and the gates put back in place and then they were dedicated, um, Nehemiah returns to Babylon Remember, he's a cupbearer for the king. So he goes back to Babylon. And then what we're looking at, or what we looked at last week with Deacon Joan, what we're looking at this week is Nehemiah's second visit. So after a period of 12 years, he returns back to Jerusalem just to check on what's going on. And what we're going to see in this section of Scripture is the reinstatement of Sabbath, observances and also Nehemiah upset about the intermarriage that's taking place between the Jews and the pagan people so he does something about that so we're going to go straight to the word of God after this prayer because there's a lot to get through today so let's bow our heads together Lord we are grateful for your love for your mercy thank you for saving us and calling us together as a people. Thank you for the sense of belonging that we have here at Harvest Temple. We're grateful for the journey that we've been on since February, looking through this challenging book of the prophet Nehemiah. We thank you for all that we've learned and the things we've been reminded of. Lord, more than just gaining knowledge, I pray that you will help us, Lord, in the weeks ahead to see these principles from your scripture lived out in our walking, in our talking, in our doing, in our interaction, in the way that we manage our personal businesses and affairs. Lord, I pray that the impact of this learning will continue to walk with us throughout our, our journey of life. This is a significant time that we find ourselves in. And we know that you are right, Lord, because you have led us here. So we give all the glory and all the praise to you. Thank you for those who have delivered part of this series. May you bless them. And thank you for all of us, Lord, who have walked this journey together. Our lives have been enriched. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's stress management and renewal. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 13, beginning at verse 15. So I'm going to read through 15 to 18 and just comment as I go. And it reads, In those days I saw men of Judah treading out the winepress on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys and bringing their wine, grapes, figs and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. 
So I rebuked them for selling their produce on that day. Some men from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise. They were selling it on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem at that. So I confronted the nobles of Judah. Why are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way? I asked. Wasn't it just this sort of thing that your ancestors did that caused our God to bring all this trouble upon us and our city? Now you're bringing even more wrath upon Israel by permitting the Sabbath to be desecrated in this way. We say amen to God's holy word. Back in 2014, I was privileged to visit Israel, a type of pilgrimage. I think it was for 10 days or so. And I remember that on uh, a Friday in particular, we did a boat trip on the Sea of Galilee. And by the time we came back to shore, it was, it was dark. And what was noticeable when we got back into our coach and uh, was then driving back to our hotel, that many of the businesses, like restaurants and so on, were closed because it was Friday evening. It was very noticeable. And they would open back after sunset on, on Saturday. And I'm sure that for some tourists, maybe this was kind of like an inconvenience. But it's very noticeable that they still observe that, certainly in parts of Israel anyway. So this observance of the Sabbath, uh, no doubt, as we can see in this portion of Scripture, was probably burdensome to the people at this time, and particularly those who wanted to trade and do business on that day. But when uh, Nehemiah returns after 12 years from Babylon to Jerusalem, this is what he finds. People were ignoring this requirement to observe the Sabbath. The streets were full with traffic. In fact, later on in the chapter, we'll see that those who were trading uh, came and were waiting outside the city. Even after Nima had come to reinstitute the Sabbath, they came and they were waiting for the gates to open to come in to trade. Nehemiah's reaction is, is one of shock, but not because I don't think because what he, he, he saw what was going on, but he knew that they had done this before and this hadn't done the, the people of Israel or the people of Judah any good because this was a serious violation of what God required of them. And this is what Nehemiah says. He says to them, what are you doing? Do you not know that God takes the Sabbath seriously? All the hurt, calamity and disaster which we have been going through has been caused according to the scripture by failure of the forefathers to observe the Sabbath regulations. And then what we see here is Nehemiah, because he's the governor of Judah, he uses his full authority to immediately make some changes. And we read this in verse 19 through to 22 and I'll read. Then I commanded that the gates of Jerusalem should be shut as darkness fell every Friday evening, not to be opened until the Sabbath ended. I sent some of my own servants to guard the gates so that no merchandise could be brought in on the Sabbath day. The merchants and tradesmen with a variety of wares camped outside Jerusalem once or twice. Well, I spoke sharply to them and said, what are you doing out here? Camping around the wall. If you do this again, I will arrest you. And that was the last time they came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to guard the gates in order to preserve the holiness of the Sabbath. So what we see here is Nehemiah being deeply concerned that this Sabbath observance is being disregarded. He took it very seriously because God takes it very seriously. And he ordered that the gates, which when he came, they were being left open on the Sabbath. He ordered that those gates should be closed. And as I said before, those who were camping outside waiting to come in to trade, he ordered them to go away and said, in fact, if you come back here, you're going to get arrested because they were violating the Sabbath. And then he ends 
this verse in, in verse 22 ends, closes with a prayer. It says, remember this good deed also, O oh my God, have compassion on me according to your great and unfailing love. So for us, what, what does this mean for us, this observance of the Sabbath? Because we know there are people today who observe the, the Sabbath. Some of my relatives, some of my cousins, they do the same. And some people observe the Sabbath not for religious purposes, but for health benefits. But what I want us to, to look at today, if you remember from the very first lesson in the book of Nehemiah, one of the points that I brought is that there is a purpose for New Testament believers when we look at the scripture in the Old Testament. What we see there is, is lots of types of shadows and pictures of important things that we should observe, but things which are to come. So we, we said that the, the Old Testament to us in this time pictorially illustrates theological principles in the New Testament. So what we're looking at here are shadows and types. Now, Shadows can be useful things. So if I'm waiting for you around the corner and you're coming to meet me and the sun is set in the right place, I can maybe see your shadow before I see you. So your shadow is an indication that you're, you're coming, you're close by, yeah? But if I was to, when you come and you meet me, if I was to bend down and try and shake the hand of the shadow and say, how are you, shadow? Great to see you. And you're standing there right next to me and I'm having interaction or trying to have interaction with the shadow. I mean, what would you think about that? It would make no sense. So what I'm saying, all these things, all these regulations that we see in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, the keeping of the Sabbath, and all those things are shadows of what is to come. And what, what came? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So Jesus has come now, so we don't give our attention to the shadow now. We turn our focus and worship and obedience to Jesus Christ. Are you getting this? Amen. So don't let nobody say to you, if you don't do X, Y, Z, you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. Because there's only one way that we are saved. By placing our faith and trust in the person and works of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So all the other stuff that we do, I'm wearing a suit and tie this morning. That don't make me saved. That's not going to get me to heaven. So there's lots of additional things that we do, which in themselves are not bad. They're okay. But we are saved because we have put our trust in the person, not in the shadows, not in the types, we are saved because we put our trust and our faith and believe in the person of Jesus Christ and what are his works. He died on the cross. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to his father and he's coming back. So if you believe that with all your hearts that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that he died for your sins, then you are saved. So we are not to focus then on the shadows, but on the person, because Jesus has come and fulfilled all of the law, hasn't he? Amen. So in Christ's first coming, he didn't abolish rest, but I believe he ushered in a deeper kind of rest that observing the Sabbath could never offer. And as we look in the Gospels in particular, Jesus, he doesn't break any of the commandments and he doesn't break this commandment of observing the Sabbath. But he hints that there's coming a change with this particular commandment. 
And at the end of Matthew 11, we can read these arresting words, which says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And if you remove the chapter break between the end of Matthew 11, and we can do that and go into Matthew 12, because the first verse of Matthew 12 says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So Jesus is talking about a new type of rest that is coming, and he's talking about it on the Sabbath. And then if you continue to read in Matthew 12, particularly 1 through to 14, we see that Jesus is involved in some controversial things there on the Sabbath day. So you will notice there that the disciples start to pick grain in the grain field on the Sabbath, and that was counted as work. You're not supposed to do that, yeah? And then Jesus goes into uh, the temple, and there's a man there with a withered hand, and the people are watching him. It's the Sabbath. What is Jesus going to do? And what does Jesus do? He heals the man with the withered hand. And I believe in Luke's account of this, it tells you they were watching Jesus. And the religious leaders were upset that Jesus healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, don't you go and loose your donkeys and your cows? And then one of them dropped down a hole on the Sabbath. Don't you go and rescue them? So why are you upset because I healed this man on the Sabbath? And the scripture said they were ashamed of themselves. They were ashamed that Jesus had done a good thing and they were decrying this thing. But it's also important in this passage in Matthew 12, in verse 8, Jesus makes a remarkable messianic claim. And in that portion of scripture, he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, what Jesus is saying he is greater than the Sabbath because he's Lord of the Sabbath. He's greater than the sacrifices because they were all pointing to him. He upset the leaders when he said, I'm greater than the temple. You read the scripture, he says, I'm greater than Jonah. I'm greater than Solomon. Greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I want to look at two passages, well, three actually, in the New Testament quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this may help us. And this is the Apostle Paul spelling out the implications of Jesus' lordship over the Sabbath. And the first scripture is in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. And it reads, Let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance, the reality, belongs to or is Jesus Christ. So we see here that Paul is putting together in one category festivals, that could, could include the Passover and festivals like that, New moon, Sabbaths, what we eat, what we drink. Don't let anybody bring any judgment on you in regards to any of these matters. Because Christ has come and observing the Sabbath no longer means that we have to observe special days or feasts. So don't let anyone pass any judgment on you in regards to that. I think that scripture is pretty clear. And then there's one in Romans 15, verse 5. Again, Paul makes another striking claim here. But what I want to do is compare two quotes, one from the Old Testament and one from the New in regards to the Sabbath. So if you look at Exodus 31, 14, it says, You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. I mean, that's pretty serious, isn't it? So that's under the law. But thank God, we're not on the law now, we're on the grace, amen? The comparison from a New Testament quote 
is taken from Romans 14 verse 5. And it reads, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So, see the contrast there between one being very serious that, you know, if you don't observe this under the law, you'll be put to death. I mean, that's serious. But Paul is readdressing this in light of the New Testament believers and saying all days are alike. So we don't necessarily have to observe the Sabbath in, in that way. And I believe that this is speaking to uh, a matter of conscience here. He says, be fully convinced in your own mind. In other words, if your mind troubles you because you don't keep the Sabbath, you know what you best do? Keep it. <laughs> but you are under no obligation to keep the Sabbath. So if it doesn't bother you, it's just the same thing when they, they ask Paul, shall we eat meat sacrificed to idols? Well, if it bothers you because it's sacrificed to idols, can remember this meat that was sacrificed to idols was the best. It was the premium meat. And you could get it at discounted prices. So some people were buying it and eating it. And the others said, no, you can't eat that meat, even though it's the best, top shelf. Don't eat it. It's been sacrificed to idols. Well, Paul said, well, if it bothers you, don't eat it. But those that it don't bother, you eat it and enjoy the meat. But he goes on to say one third the thing though. He says, if in eating it, it offends your brother, don't eat it in front of your brother or your sister. <laughs> Amen. What wisdom from the scripture. So this is a matter of conscience. You must be convinced in your own mind. So if this is something that troubles you, observe the Sabbath. But if... We're not under obligation to observe the Sabbath in that way. And then one other interesting passage is from Acts 15. And this is when Paul and Barnabas had gone out into like the Gentile world, preaching the gospel, and many Gentiles were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then they went to the headquarters in Jerusalem, where Peter and James were there, and what was happening, the Jewish believers or the Jewish people who had come to faith in Christ were saying that these Gentile believers have to be circumcised. They can't just get saved and say they're worshipping God and they're saved. They have to be circumcised. So they had a big meeting, kind of like what we have, church conference. They call the church conference. And um, the result of this we can see, let me just read Acts 15 verse 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them, and there's four things you're going to see here. So this is what the requirements of the Gentiles are. It says to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. So you see the, the four requirements there for Gentiles, of which I believe probably most of us in here are because we're not Jewish. Four requirements that were, and it pleased the, 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 the leaders of the church to say, take this out into the Gentile world and this is what the Gentiles should live by. So in other words, they didn't need to be circumcised. Didn't need to observe the Sabbath. They need to offer sacrifices and, and, and so on and so forth. So we see all of that really then are shadows. But what it's really portraying to us in this time that we still need to observe the Sabbath in a way that fulfills what the Sabbath was created for. And I believe that if we don't, 
we will reach a point of burnout. And that's why I've called this message God's Stress Management and Renewal. Because the Sabbath to me is God's way of, you know, busting stress. How we manage stress and prevent burnout. We're living in a time of pressure and the pressure seems to be, you know, going up as we go through this year in particular. How do we in this time prevent burnout? Well, it's important that we rest. Your body needs rest. Amen. Your mind needs rest. We have to rest. And I believe in doing that, that's how we fulfill this requirement of the Sabbath. On the grace in this New Testament time, we're governed by the New Testament. We see that God created the, the world, didn't he? Well, more than the world, the universe. In six days, and then he rested. What do you think God uh, rested? Do you think he was tired? No. I think what God was really setting in motion and in order is a pattern for us. After God was through, he created everything in six days. After he was through, he inaugurated the Sabbath and he rested. Exodus twenty eleven tells us that. And I believe that this pattern or this principle of the Sabbath and God resting on the seventh day, which by the way, the seventh day is Saturday. It's not Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. I know most of our calendars show the first day of the week as Monday, but Sunday is the first day of the week and the Sabbath is Saturday. And I believe one of the principles that we can draw out of this in God resting is that we too must rest because it doesn't matter how hard you work to provide for yourself, we have to recognize that ultimately our provision comes from God. I've been in a situation where I worked for a fantastic company for a decade and yes, the finance that I earned met many needs in my life, but one day I was made redundant or my job, not me, I wasn't made redundant. My job was made redundant. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, hey, God is my provider. So he's used a channel to provide for me. Now that channel has, has been closed down. Is there life beyond working for whichever company? Yes, there is, because God is our provider. So we can work hard and we can do that extra shift but not at the expense of not resting. It's not worth it, brethren. You need to take time to rest. And in resting, you're trusting God that you've done your work, but you're trusting God he will provide, whether through your employer or through some other means. God will provide. So it's important that we take time to rest. So that's the first reason, I believe, for the inauguration of the Sabbath. The second reason is often ignored, but we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. God said to Israel, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. The Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord, your God, commands you to observe the Sabbath. So the second reason is that we take time to stop and reflect on the deliverance of God. Remember these children of Israel, they were in bondage in Egypt and they came out and they were by the Red Sea. There there was problems going on there, but God opened the sea, brought them across, provided food for them, provided clothing that they didn't grow out or didn't wear out. And God says, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that you can't save yourself. You didn't deliver yourself. I delivered you. Again, coming on the grace, we are to observe the Sabbath because we need rest for our bodies, for our minds, and also to recognize that our source is God. But we also need to rest. And when we rest, 
recognize that God is our deliverance. He's our salvation. Amen? And what God has brought us through. God has done that, so we need to remember that in those times of rest. So there's a rest, two, two types of rest there. We see a rest where there is a ceasing from work. So we, we work, then we stop, and we rest. But there's also a rest where we rejoice in the mighty deliverance of God. And that deliverance is a process, the second one. It's a process. And I want to read this scripture again from Matthew 11, where Jesus says these wonderful words. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's talking about the rest of salvation, freedom from from your sin. I will give you rest. But he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. So let me go over that again. So the first rest is, come to me if you have heavy burdens. If you're laden down, and I will give you rest. So that's one type of rest. And that could be, you could say that's an instant rest, because the moment you come, you confess your sins, you enter into that rest. But the second one is to take my yoke upon me and learn from me and you will find rest for your soul so there is a rest that is given and there is a rest that is found there's a rest that is given when we accept Jesus Christ but there is also a rest that is found how do we find this second rest well as we journey with the Lord as we exercise spiritual disciplines of of prayer and fasting and reading the scripture, and meditating in God's words, that's how we go through that process of finding that second type of rest. So that means that as we journey on as Christians, the things that I worry about, or used to worry about five years ago, hopefully, as I draw nearer to the Lord, I understand more of his word, I trust him more, I should not be worrying about those things that I was worrying about five years ago, because I found rest I've found that God's peace, amen, is available. And I hope that you're experiencing the same thing. You know, even over this month of prayer, I can tell you I found some rest. Yes, I definitely found some rest. I've been able to just give up some things to God and say, well, God, it's in your hand. You just take care of it. So that's a process of finding rest. I wonder if anybody wants to enter into a deeper type of rest this afternoon. Well, you know, you got to do those spiritual disciplines. Sometimes they're not exciting, not always exciting, not always lit up with lights. But they are absolutely necessary for our peace of mind and for us to enter into rest. So do you see why I'm calling this God's stress management program? Yeah? So if you're stressed out, then you need to take time to, to rest. The first rest coming through salvation in Christ. But the second rest is what we discover as we walk that journey with God. So I'm going to move on and then look at the final problem that Nehemiah faces in in Israel here with uh, the people disobeying the law. And it's in verse 23 of chapter 13. It says, about the same time I realized that some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashad, Ammon and Moab. Furthermore, half their children spoke the language of Ashad. Ashdod, sorry, or of some other people and could not speak the language of Judah at all. So what we see here is because of the disobedience of the grown-ups, the big people, the fathers, the children suffer. So when the big people disobey and go their own way, the children, the generations that follow will suffer to the point that they could not speak the language of Judah. Isn't that a shame? Stripped of their language. You know, that's why I am not ashamed to speak Papua, you know. (laughs) And my children can, they can chop it too. And I'm pleased to say, if I was to put them on a plane and send them to Jamaica, they'd be able to understand what everybody is saying there. When you lose your language, you know, that's a, that's a serious thing. 
to some of us here from other places around the world, maybe Africa, Asia. Teach your children your language. Teach your children your language. These people, the next generation couldn't speak the language of Judah. Why? Because they were being influenced by pagans. And the whole of this situation here is not so much talking, it's not a racial situation. And Reverend Nathan went into these two messages ago. It's not because God didn't want to forbid them to marry people from other ethnicities. But what God was wanting to guard them against is them being influenced by pagan worship. So this is what Nehemiah does. I mean, he takes some drastic action here. Verse 25. So I confronted them and called down curses on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Why? This is the prophet of God. I don't know if um, Nehemiah did karate or something like that. But something... (laughs) He said, I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their people intermarry with the pagan people of the land. Wasn't this exactly what led King Solomon of Israel into sin? I demanded. There was no king from any nation who could compare to him. And God loved him and made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by his foreign wives. How could you even think of committing this sinful deed and acting unfaithfully towards God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joida, of Eliashib, the high priest, had married a daughter of Sanballat the Horonite, so I banished him from my presence. So what we see here is Nehemiah is kind of doing the equivalent of what Jesus did. You know when Jesus went into the temple... I think uh, Deacon Joe mentioned this last week, turned over the table of the money changes and so on. Nehemiah is doing this. But what we must remember, this is a shadow. <laughs> it's a shadow. So it's not giving me license to call down, curse on anybody and pull out your beard and whatever. No. So we are not to do these sorts of things. Yeah? It's a shadow. Remember, it's a shadow. Somebody say it's a shadow. And we must never forget that. What we see here is um, God, again, as I said, is trying to say to his people, I don't want you to be influenced by these pagan worshippers. And you know that um, some time ago, I, I I studied black and Asian theology. I did a module in that. And there was a brother there from South Africa And one of the lessons he gave his experience of how the scripture was used in South Africa, you know, to enforce apartheid. Isn't that that a, a horrible, heinous thing? And he mentioned of how... Similar to this, because what I'm trying to show you here that we can, we can, this scripture is not really to be applied in this way. So we're not saying that you can't marry somebody from another ethnicity. I want to make that clear. When they did that in, in South Africa, um, the Dutch did that. And to this day, that country is still suffering from the effects of apartheid. And I know also from the reading of Marcus Garvey. Anybody read anything from Marcus Garvey? You're too safe to read that. Okay. <laughs> Marcus Garvey says the same thing in his writing. So it's not talking about applying that in this day and time like that. But rather, as I said, it's, it's talking about how we protect ourselves from pagan or ungodly influences. And we see here that Nehemiah does something uh, commendable and acts in zeal. I mean, he's very upset about this. He drives these people away because he was offended by the fact that the grandson of the high priest had married the daughter of Sanballat the Horonite. He was a worshipper of the god Horon, who had opposed him from the very beginning when they came to build a wall. Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, we know, had opposed Nehemiah. So what does this mean and how do we apply this principle today? Well, I believe that God wants us to live by his biblical principles. 
You know, one of the mistakes we can do is try to run the church like a business. You can't run the church like a business. We have to do things God's way. And as Christians, it's the same thing. If we try to run our lives by the philosophies of this world, we're going to get in trouble. We're going to find ourselves in big problems. That's why God has given us the word. We have to do things God's way. The famous song, I did it my way. No, 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 no. Do it God's way. God's way. And that's why we have the Holy Word and we have the Scripture. And that's why we need to delve into it. That's why we've taken time to go through this uh, passage without rushing it to really extract from it the principles and the truth in God's Word that will set us free. So we have to be careful what we borrow from the world. We have to be careful what philosophies that we take on and try to apply in our living or the way we govern and run church. Because God has set out in his word how we ought to live. Amen. Amen. And then Nehemiah goes to prayer. He says, remember them, O my God, for they have defiled the priesthood and the solemn vows of the priests and Levites. So I purge out everything foreign and assign tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. I also made sure that the supply of wood for the altar and the first portions of the harvest were brought in at the proper times. And then he closes this great book by saying, remember this in my favor, O oh my God. Nehemiah has the whole of this, the, the, the priesthood and the Levites um, sanctified and puts things back in right and proper order. Because that priesthood represents Jesus. It's a shadow of Jesus. And I want to just, in closing, look at Luke 4. Jesus here defines the work of the church. Because sometimes we can forget the purpose why the church exists. And we can get caught up in doing all sorts of things. But in Luke 4, Jesus, quoting from the prophet Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to give liberty to the captives and freedom to the oppressed and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the work of the church. Amen? That's the work of the church, to preach to people. And I like the ordering here. I think the, the, the Holy Spirit is careful to order this through the prophet Isaiah and repeated here by, by Jesus. I like the order. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. In other words, to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the work of the church. And sometimes we get it mixed up, don't we? But we are to share the message of Jesus Christ to the poor, bind up broken hearts, etc., etc. When we don't do that, the church suffers. When we lose our focus and when we get sidetracked into doing other things, the church of Jesus Christ suffers. So let's remember that. I want to close with this quotation from a theologian, John R. W. Stott. And he puts it this way. Our motive must be concerned for the glory of God, not the glory of the church or our own personal glory. Our message must be the good news of God as given by Christ and his apostles, not the traditions of men or our own opinions. Our manpower must be the whole church of God and every member of it, not a privileged few who want to retain certain ministry as their own prerogative. Our dynamic must be the spirit of God, not the power of human personality or organization or eloquence. 
Without these priorities, we shall be silent when we ought to be vocal. So we see Nehemiah ends his, this chapter in a very practical way in reinstituting the Sabbath. And that speaks to us of rest, rest, finding rest in Christ, but also the process of, of, of rest that deepens as we walk the, the journey of the Christian life. Then also he reminds them, and for us it's a reminder that we should be careful of the influences in our lives. That we should not be influenced by pagan traditions or ungodly living or the ways and philosophies of the world. Later on when the service closes, I want to share something with you, church, about uh, an outreach and For me, coming out of a month of prayer and going through the book of Nehemiah, I believe that God too wants us to do something practical. I don't believe that all the praying and all the studying we've been doing is just to make us feel good and then we just go on to the next service next week. So I'll be sharing with you um, what I believe God has laid on my heart. As Christians here, to change the world, we have to be united in our faith and that's the theme for this series faith united i wonder if anyone here today has not come to faith in jesus christ you have not experienced the peace that jesus offers not peace that you can buy off the shelf not peace you can bid for in an auction and it goes to the highest bidder peace that the prince of peace Jesus Christ alone can offer a peace that can mount guard over your heart and mind. A peace that can keep you even when the storms of your life or storms around your life are raging. It comes by way of accepting the person of Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior and confessing your sins to God and receiving the forgiveness that Jesus Christ can offer because he died in our stead and bore our sins, but he also bore our sicknesses and diseases and he became a curse for us that we might enter into the blessings of Abraham, the scripture says. If you have not experienced that, I want to make an invitation to you today. God is real. The work of the cross is real. You may have your doubts and you may be searching and you may be looking here, there and everywhere. But I want to invite you to Jesus Christ today. I don't have to prove to you anything. I know that my life has been transformed. And many of us in here can testify that we're not what we used to be. We've been changed. I wonder if you want to experience that for yourself. You may not be an evil person as, you know, would hit headlines for doing things which are wrong, but we were all born in sin. And we are all lost without Jesus Christ. And what I'm inviting you to is life in Jesus and to spend eternity with God. If you're here today or you're watching on the stream, Maybe you can indicate by raising your hand if you want to receive Jesus Christ today. I can guarantee you it will be the best decision that you ever make in your life. Is there anybody here as we just, believers, be praying in your hearts? Just be praying in your hearts. Someone may be struggling right now to take this step forward to make this decision. Just be praying in your hearts that God just releases the faith and grace to allow someone to take that step. While we're waiting, I want for another invitation to go out now for those who are believers. And there's warring going on in your mind, in your spirit. You can't rest. You're anxious. You're worrying about many things. The future may even seem bleak to you, even though you're a Christian, even though you're saved. Maybe the stress of what's going on in the world, 
what you hear in the headlines. It could be a family situation, a personal situation, a health situation. If you are stressed, and this is not meant to embarrass anybody or put anyone in the spotlight. In fact, if we want to take this part of the service offline, we can do that. Because it's not meant to show anybody. And you know, we all, we all fall into this place of stress from time to time, don't we? If we're honest, no matter how strong we think we are, sometimes things come along and sweep us off our feet and we find ourselves in a place of doubt and worrying and, and fretting. So I'm not talking about that because that happens to everybody. I'm talking about when that happens and you can't get out of it. Because it happens to everybody. But the majority of us bounce back, don't we? We get up, we dust ourselves down, we come back to our senses, but we say, but God is mighty. What am I worrying myself over? But sometimes you can't get up. I'm speaking to that person today. You're struggling to get up. You've been knocked off, the, off your feet. The winds have been knocked out of your sail and you're struggling. We want to pray with you before we close this service today because we believe that in praying, God is going to send deliverance. Amen. Amen. I believe that. Let's stand together, please. Okay, I'm going to pray. Even though no one's come forward, that's okay. I'm going to pray in faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to the close of this book. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for this journey. Thank you for the very important things that you have deposited in our lives. Maybe review these things in the, in the days ahead. And now I turn my attention to praying for those in this sanctuary and those watching online who have not yet made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Lord, you are extending salvation, rest to them. I pray in the name of Jesus that you by the Holy Spirit will inspire their hearts and gift them the faith, the courage and the will to choose Jesus right now, today. Because today is a day of salvation. Lord, that they will pull aside living their own way and receive you, Lord Jesus, not clinging to a shadow or knowledge, but receiving the person of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, and experience that transformation in their lives today. And so in faith, we thank you. We thank you because we believe that someone in this building, someone watching online is receiving Jesus Christ right now. So we thank you, Lord, for that life that is transformed. And Lord, I also pray for individuals, and they're in this building, I know, Lord, who are under stress. Anxiety is the order of their day. Maybe some circumstances has knocked them off their feet, and Lord, they're trying to get up, but they can't get up. They're struggling in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we release your power into every one of these representative circumstances now in Jesus' name. And just like Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was being tested, Lord, and he was weak, you sent an angel to strengthen him. And there are ministering spirits sent forth to those who are heirs of salvation. So we pray for a dispatch right now of angels to come into these circumstances. Those that are in the gutter, those who are struggling to get up, Lord, weighed down by burdens. We pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just like you did with the, with the servant of Elisha. Draw back that curtain and let them see into the spiritual realm that there is more for them than that is against them, Lord. May they receive strength today in the name of Jesus. Strengthen them, Lord, spiritually on the inside by the power of the Holy Spirit, O oh God. Greater one in them, rise up in Jesus' name. 
I pray God they will stand up like a like a mighty army and throw off the stress and anxiety and fretting in the name of Jesus. And yes, Lord, we travail in prayer because we're giving birth to this in the name of Jesus. We're giving birth to this in the name of Jesus. We're giving birth to this in the name of Jesus. And so we say to those who are down on the floor, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. We're not offering you silver. We're not offering you gold. But in the name of Jesus. We command that strength come into you now in Jesus' name. Get up, take up your mat and walk in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. And Lord, as we prayed yesterday in our Saturday morning prayer meeting, if there is any sin, anything that's blocking this deliverance, Lord, we pray you will reveal it right now. And we pray that confessions will come forth to loose your people. We get rid of all the property of the enemy. And anything that gives a foothold of the enemy in our minds and give access to the devil in our lives, in the name of Jesus. We command a spiritual clear out in Jesus' name so that your blessing, mighty God, can flow into the lives of your people. So we declare in this house peace. We declare in this house rest. You'll be able to sleep. You're going to be able to sleep. Yes, Lord, let them experience the rest of the Sabbath. Walk in that rest. Hallelujah. Trust God for that rest. In the name of Jesus. Can we give a shout of praise to God in this house? Can we give a shout of praise to God in this house? He is our deliverer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus breaks every fetter. Every fetter is broken. Fetters of depression are broken today in the name of Jesus. Fetters of confusion are broken today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Bondages of anxiety is broken in the name of Jesus. And we release the peace of God that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. Keep your people in perfect peace, mighty God, as they keep their minds stayed on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's praise God in this house. Thank him for deliverance in this house today. Hallelujah. We are free by the grace of God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Can we just give thanks one more time to God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful, Lord. Grateful for your love, your grace, your mercy, for your power working in our lives. We bless your holy name.